You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock. There is considerable and growing interest in understanding state capacity for achieving inclusive development, and especially the role of the bureaucracy in this process. Several scholars have over the years highlighted the extent to which institutions in certain developing countries often lack the power to effectively project authority and implement policies. There may also be a substantial gap between public policy objectives and their actual execution, which in turn may reduce the credibility and legitimacy of the state. In some instances, bureaucracies allow officials to actually extract public resources without providing sufficient services to citizens. Even well-intentioned and coherent bureaucracies can face challenges in service delivery, and patronage politics can persist in well-established democracies. Bureaucracies also exhibit significant variation in their ability to implement policies both between and within countries, across various policy functions, and even within specific administrative tasks. However, despite these challenges, there are actually several examples of effective public service delivery in developing country contexts. India is a particularly interesting case here. While the Indian bureaucracy is often criticized for being captured and thereby unable to execute its core functions, it is at the same time able to coordinate hugely challenging tasks such as periodic elections. This paradox is further evident in the puzzling disparities in performance across the various Indian states, exemplified by the country's success in eradicating polio, even as its public health systems face significant challenges. My guest today is Akshay Mangla, who is an Associate Professor of International Business at the University of Oxford Said Business School. He specializes in comparative politics and the political economy of development. Akshay has studied the uneven performance of public services in India. And in a new book, Making Bureaucracy Work, Norms, Education and Public Service Delivery in Rural India, he examines how and why some bureaucracies deliver education services more effectively than others. Akshay finds that variations in bureaucratic norms, that is, informal rules guiding public officials and their interactions with citizens, result in diverse implementation patterns and outcomes. While some agencies adhere strictly to legalistic approaches, emphasizing rule compliance, others foster deliberation and encourage flexible problem solving with local communities, ultimately improving the quality of education services. If you're enjoying listening to the show, I would be very grateful if you could rate us, leave a comment and consider sharing the podcast on your social media channels. Thank you very much. Akshay, it's great to see you. Congratulations on a wonderful book. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here. As you write about in the book, but also there's considerable focus in the literature, bureaucracy, bureaucrats are associated often with all the bad stuff, right? So clientelism, political patronage, slow, inefficient, bureaucrats seem to be lazy. They may be even accused of being disrespectful to people living in poverty, arrogant, you, you name it. And so there is a lot of pessimism about the role of the bureaucracy. And there's often this feeling that it's only the political trigger that can get slow, lazy bureaucrats off their chairs to fast track development. Why do you think that kind of pessimistic picture still persists about the bureaucracy? Thank you for uh, painting that picture for us. That's actually the I think quite an accurate image in a lot of academic research and even in the kind of lay idea of what a bureaucracy is. Often when I'm sharing my research with groups of people, I ask in the audience, you know, what do you think of bureaucracy? How many people like bureaucracy? And please raise your hands. I typically will get one hand 
<laughs> uh, often someone who might have spent some time in a bureaucracy and got to see what it's like inside. And so this notion of bureaucracy being a pejorative term, something that gets in the way, you know, when we say there's a lot of bureaucracy, certainly that individual bureaucrat is seen as a problem. The challenge with that perspective is that so much of what we as, as citizens of a place need and want and aspire towards require agents of the state, bureaucrats, to carry out their core functions. And so I think just as a starting point, it's, it's quite a pessimistic view of the world if all bureaucrats were to be exactly like that image you just described. And I think in, in the motivation for this work, one thing that struck me as I just began doing my field work, talking to bureaucrats, was just the varieties of bureaucracy that can actually exist that it isn't just one thing. In the same way, we have central concepts in political science, democracy. Well, we recognize that democracy has, has adjectives. We recognize authoritarianism has adjectives. These are not just one monolithic thing. Likewise, bureaucracy can be very different things, have different levels of efficacy. And I think digging into those variations and different patterns allows us to have a more nuanced conversation about its role in development. Agreed. And I think one of the most important things here is the kind of uh, discipline that some of these organizations and the bureaucrats that work within these organizations, the kind of discipline that guides behavior, certain rules, which institutionalizes new recruits into that organizational culture. There are norms that are created. There are certain, certain procedures that guarantee predictability of decision-making. That is one set of issues, Akshay. But there's also something that you emphasize, and that is the role of discretion as in trying to figure out innovative ways of doing things and not being constrained by institutionalized norms. And I'd like you to think a little bit about how these things play out, because by adhering to rules, you are following the book, the playbook. You are doing things and in a way that guarantees that certain things are efficiently delivered. They may perhaps limit state capture. They may limit certain other problems of implementation. But that could also work in the opposite way, that it could actually exclude some people. It could reinforce certain bad behaviors, right? And that's where discretion comes in. That's where bureaucrats have to sort of make decisions on the ground in order to resolve these very, very complex issues. So can you highlight for my listeners this, this balance, this fine tuning of being a follower of rules and also at the same time being you know, adaptable? Yeah, this is a great way to kind of get into the nitty gritty of what a bureaucracy is and what it does. And I think the way you just framed it is I think the way a lot of political scientists have thought about uh, what makes bureaucracy effective in distinguishing this rules versus discretion. On the one hand, a bureaucracy has to abide by a certain organizational structure. That structure has a hierarchy, there's defined roles, and there's rules that the bureaucrats follow. On the other hand, bureaucrats cannot just be automatons. They have to look at a particular problem, and they have to be able to respond to the particular instances of that problem that occur in their office. And I think the, the existing work has really overlooked this middle space between rules and discretion, which I theorize as norms. And norms are not just what's formally there in, in a rule book that is encoded, but rather a learned set of practices that emerge over time through a process of, like you said, socialization. So it's not simply that I can just tell a bureaucrat, here's your manual. And now whatever policy you're given, you will know how to implement it. And I think part of the, the, the purpose of this book is to actually build that link between the role of norms in helping to guide bureaucratic discretion and how officials even interpret what a policy means in the first place. And let me just perhaps give a practical example. When you think about the, the kind of bureaucrat we see almost every day on the street, and I look at street level bureaucrats, and we can talk about how they may be different from elite bureaucrats, say those working in a central bank, but I'm looking at school teachers, uh, health workers, police, and think of thinking about the role of police in area that I'm studying now. When a police officer is there on the street doing the beat, uh, deciding whether or not to stop some individual, that police officer is exerting discretion. Now, what is guiding that 
uh, that execution of discretion. There has to be some sense of a professional norm or some notion of what the law is, right? And some of that is encoded in, in, in written format. There's countries have constitutions that define what those rules are, but a lot of it is learned through the process of becoming a police officer, being socialized into the organizational norms and culture of a police agency and how that officer decides in a particular instance whether I should stop someone or not stop someone isn't just going to be written down in a rule book. It has to be learned. There has to be some larger purpose to the police's work that that officer imbibes and has to make really difficult decisions, actually. Now, other things can creep in, things like biases, right? Uh, there could be heuristics. There could be uh, sets of incentives that uh, that a bureaucracy gives to, uh, 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 you know, to its frontline agents to carry out their duties. But what I argue in the book is that norms provide a broad uh, a set of, uh, you could say, informal guidelines that allow bureaucrats to really make sense of what their mandate actually is. And it's not easily encoded just in a, in a given rule book. Often uh, police officers look at what other police officers are doing. What is my senior officer doing? So I think in that way, it's a social process of learning that takes place inside an agency. Talking about rules, I am thinking back three decades or two and a half decades when I was doing field work in India, in Orissa, looking at starvation debts. And one of the things I was looking at was so-called scarcity manuals that the Indian bureaucracy operates with. These were actually formulated by the British colonial administration to provide bureaucrats with advice, you know, a checklist, you know, looking at the kind of crop loss that you could see with your own eyes, the devastation or migration of people that are just all the price increases in the local markets of, of food grains. So there were these wonderfully detailed manuals that the Indian civil service still uses but it turned out, Akshay, that some of the challenges were that these manuals often had not been updated. And that is when discretion comes in. That's when people have to know, you know, when is it that I should, you know, stick to whatever is written in the manuals and when should I go about, use my own discretion to, to figure out what to do. But I also thought of something else in terms of street level bureaucrats, because I've been studying Indian administrative service officers, elite bureaucrats in India. Your cases of school teachers or even the policemen or revenue officers, people who are very close to the ground, so to speak, they may be motivated, obviously, by ways or they could experiment in order to implement something better because they're aware of the local situation, but they can also be motivated by their own standing in that society. And I've been doing a study in Malawi of looking at forest guards, how they are tasked with combating deforestation and the transport of illegally produced charcoal. And it turns out they are actually willing to allow this illegal trade sometimes to continue because they live in the community and their houses would be burned down by angry residents if they enforce the rule book. So can you please reflect a little bit on those constraints that do facilitate discretion, which may or may not be good for the delivery of certain services? Yeah, uh, and thanks for that example. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's two, you could say, directions one could take that example you just gave about, the say, a forest guard. Uh, and I think uh, I would start by uh, no by noticing the the problem you raised, uh, which is that that forest guard may be embedded within a community. And this is a challenge of embeddedness that you raise that by being embedded in the community, you're beholden to the community's norms. And therefore, you're not able to carry out your functions as a public servant, but rather you're, in a sense, captured. Now, this is interesting because there's quite a debate in social science about what this embeddedness actually is it is it a problem or is it a solution and i'll point you for example on the solution side to the work by lily sai at mit on china and she has a book on public goods provision in rural china uh, where she finds that officials that are embedded within certain local social groups she looks at uh, temple groups and church groups they're more likely to seek moral standing but that moral standing ends up holding them accountable even in the absence of elections uh, to be a kind of seen as a well uh, 
stand a, an upstanding member of the local community, they have to provide more public goods. So she finds that they actually tend to provide better roads, better schools, for instance. On the flip side, you could say that having that embeddedness will take away from your ability to, to respond to the agency's needs. And I think the the, the counterpoint to this, and I'll, I'll point you to that uh, classic book, which I'm sure you came across, Herbert Kaufman's Forest Ranger. Um, this was on trying to understand the US Forest Service. And this is like, you know, one of the most difficult problems, you cannot watch forest officers. They're in the forest. How do you know they're doing what you would like them to be doing? And what he talks about is actually this organizational identity that comes through being socialized into becoming a forest ranger. And that is a, a critical source of public service motivation. And that service motivation gets reinforced through training, through communication, through, through meeting again as a group outside of your local community. And so in a sense, trying to imbibe a set of organizational norms that can be counter or at least be a, a, a kind of, uh, you could say, a, a, a distinct set of motivations from the community norms. And I think part of the challenge for frontline bureaucrats, you just pointed out, is that they actually have to balance often between these competing demands, demands from within their organization and demands that are coming from the community outside their organization. And this is where I think the, 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 the kind of guidance of discretion is, is fundamentally required. And it often comes from senior officials. So looking to leaders to help you identify what is the way I deal with conflicts on the job. Um, I will just end by saying this problem is not unique to frontline bureaucrats. In fact, in my book, when I look at education, I look at it as an education bureaucracy, not as an individual, but across levels of the state. And I think one thing I would urge us to do in our theorization and our discussions about bureaucracies to see it as an institution rather than as just an assemblage of individuals. Because as an institution, you'll have to think about what is the relationship between that frontline official and a higher up official, a middle manager, and a senior bureaucrat, as you mentioned, someone in a kind of elite civil service position. And so to understand how well that kind of motivation travels down that chain, one has to look at the communication patterns, one has to look at the kind of uh, uh, up and down down of information across levels of an organizational hierarchy. And that is often left as a black box in a lot of our theorizing, which I try to open up in this book. When we started this conversation, of course, I said that there was a lot of negative sort of pessimism associated with, with a bureaucrat. But it turns out in development, especially in relation to the developmental state, the bureaucrat has been known to have played a very important point. So I'm going to refer to embedded autonomy by one of my former teachers, Peter Evans, the sociologist, how bureaucrats actually took that decision to get development, get sort of these big businesses to invest in the areas that they were posted. So there was this ownership. And this is a bit also in parts of China. As you know, Union Ang has also written about this. And I've seen this also when I've studied China is that there's this pride that, you know, my success can be seen by the number of investments that I was able to attract or, or the number of roads and how developed my area is. So embeddedness in that form is also good. But Peter Evans in Embedded Autonomy, of course, talks about India and Brazil too, where embeddedness did not lead to the same kind of results as it did in South Korea. So I think there's both of the positives and the negatives to, to this embeddedness. Absolutely. And I think you've, you've just uh, named two of my favorite authors on this uh, topic. And perhaps I'll, I'll allude to what each of these authors have to say in, 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 in kind of building uh, an understanding with you on this. One is that, uh, really importantly, Evans identifies this important added dimension, which he calls embeddedness, which he adds to autonomy. And autonomy was this kind of idea building off of this Weberian state uh, notion of a rule-bound agency that's really distinct and closed and separate from society. So it's able to formulate its own rules, independent of intrusion and political manipulations and so on. The downside of that is that there's a massive information problem. 
when you're closed off from society. And Evans rightly identified that actually for a developmental state and looking at places like South Korea, looking at places like Singapore, for example, the state not only had some degree of autonomy, but had to have those linkages to societal groups. And the groups he looks at are these business associations, right? Providing information to develop effective industrial policy, a problem that we're uh, seeing just regenerating today. Now, what I think one can add to this, and I think Yuan Yuan Ang does this really remarkably well in her group, is A, to identify what are the characteristics of non-Weberian states? And remarkably, China does not meet any <laughs> Weberian criteria uh, for its bureaucracy, except that it has a very strong, as you mentioned, esprit de corps. Uh, there's a very strong sense of organizational identity. But that identity is not necessarily tied to being closed. In fact, and this is an interesting, perhaps, counterpoint to public imaginations about the Chinese bureaucracy. In my own reading of the secondary literature, Ang and other authors, the Chinese bureaucracy is much more open to information and learning from society than, say, bureaucracy in India. And I think that is an important element of embeddedness that has to be brought in. The challenge with embeddedness, and this is, I think, an important uh, uh, distinction that needs to be raised in the Indian case, is that is is that the the social groups over which the bureaucracy may be embedded are extremely hierarchical. So we have caste dimensions that come in. Uh, there's uh, identity differences that are quite significant and fragmentation. So the political scientist Ron Herring uh, from Cornell calls India a case of embedded particularism, not embedded autonomy. It ends up being very particular business interests that try to uh, benefit from these interactions with the, you know, with the Indian state rather than a cohesive social group that can share broad-based information which can help Help with say provision of public goods for business. So consequently, you find embeddedness in the Indian case going into this direction of individuals seeking uh, their kind of more targeted demands and targeted needs, particularistic needs from the state rather than broad-based public goods. And so this is one of the challenges where how do you get a bureaucracy to function in a way that is public-minded, public-oriented, when the societal conditions are also challenging? And I think this is where I draw on Evans and others, is that we have to see bureaucracy as being located in a particular societal context to make better sense of what are the organizational features that will allow it to succeed and fail. It cannot just be seen as a purely abstract entity out independent of society. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, actually. I think we really should be bringing the bureaucracy back in much more. We should be studying the, the bureaucracy even more. And thinking about some of the work I was doing 20, 25 years ago on public admin, I remember there was this Indian scholar, R.B. Jain, a wonderful guy from Delhi University. And in many of the International Political Science Association meetings and groups, we would talk about implementation, et cetera. The literature then on implementation, it, and it still is the case, is so heavily influenced by Western cases that there was a dearth of literature studying the bureaucracy and implementation in low-income country settings, in developing country settings. I think that is improving, but it's still something that we should encourage further research on. But going back to India now, let's set the scene. So I have, in my studies, been actually rather impressed by these bureaucrats. And I'm thinking about young people like you. I've been studying the district collectors, the district magistrates, who are the lords of this huge territory with millions of people. And they are in charge of law and order, revenue, provision of social services. They're just the, the super generalists who are, you know, able to tackle hundreds of issues. And I remember on Saturday sitting beside them. Oh, by the way, the, the more important, the more powerful the bureaucrat, the bigger the office, you know, with all those chairs. And there are five or six delegations meeting this one bureaucrat at the same time. And I'm sitting beside observing this, the grievance day, and marveling at how one individual, a relatively young person, trying to dispense justice, address complaints, address grievances. So I've been pretty impressed with what I have seen, but yet the characterization of the Indian bureaucracy is often also that it just doesn't deliver development enough. So there's this paradox I see in the literature, which you also discuss in the book, that on the one hand, this adherence to procedures, norms, rules, whatever, prevents often effective implementation, 
and the bureaucracy is seen to be just a cog in the wheel and is waiting for the political masters to, to get them into action. And yet the other paradox is also that this inefficient, so-called inefficient bureaucracy can administer elections on this massive scale and actually coordinate this, right, for, for this huge country. You also highlight the fact that on the one hand, India is able to prevent polio and at the same time have an inefficient public health system. So what explains this paradox or apparent paradox, Akshay? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think uh, this is the question that you asked really begs for a lot more research. And I may, maybe I'll just open up a few avenues that I find illuminating in this domain. One, um, going back to your earlier point about implementation being critical, I think that is where the focus on state capacity in India, uh, research has been going and policymakers are also aware that implementation is a critical issue and a challenge. Interestingly enough, the, 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 the literature on implementation, as you rightly bring out, came a lot from the West. Some of the first studies of implementation were about failures of large scale federal programs in the United States when they reached that local level and states pushed back and the local governments pushed back and so on. In the case of India, the feeling quite often is that these programs are well designed by these incredible bureaucrats who, by the way, pass an exam that is much, much harder than any exam I've ever passed. I guess those who flunk out try to become professors like <laughs> us, right? And so then they end up uh, in these kinds of places reading and writing about bureaucracy rather than doing it. But anyhow, these are really, really uh, the tail end of the kind of, you know, talent pool. And so they're in, 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 in these high up positions. And you look at the literature on the Indian state over time, and there's been this paradoxical presentation. Gunnar Murdahl referred to India as a soft state. Uh, the Rudolphs uh, referred to India as the weak hyphen strong state. So there's the weak and strong, right? And we've seen other names, other monikers. The most recent one, I think that's gained a lot of traction is Land Pritchett's flailing state. And the flailing state image is quite, quite apropos to your example in that it, he talks about this kind of overdeveloped brain at the center. That's the Indian Administrative Service, that bureaucrat you said, who's the district collector, the district magistrate. And that brain has all this capacity, but is disconnected uh, from her arms, which happen to be the local level official, the school teacher, the cop, the, the, the district official in charge of development and so on. And so this discontinuity between the brain and its fingers and the arms is this idea that the Indian state is not able to connect itself. Well, one answer to what uh, your the, the puzzle that you raise is that, well, the Indian state is able to develop those connections when it has a burden of energy around a very fixed period of time. And so Devesh Kapoor has written on this when he talks about the Indian state having episodic state capacity, that the state capacity has bursts and episodes. And elections are a great example, right? You have an election at a fixed time. You can have a plan uh, for when you're going to have it. You can assemble everyone. And then there's an exit. You actually stop doing elections. And I think something like polio eradication, while not exactly an election, is one of those, those interventions that can be considered more logistical and time bound in the sense that you have to get polio drop, the immunization out, right? And once you get it out, you reduce the incidence of polio. But when you have chronic problems in a health system like malnutrition, right? Or just every, I mean, you think about the chronic diseases that, that one observes uh, in, in, in India, that requires repeated interactions of higher complexity. And those tasks require information exchange and robust relationships between the local state and citizens. And I try to theorize this in the book by rather than thinking about the bureaucracy is good or bad, let's look at the tasks that the bureaucracy has to carry out and their degree of complexity. And across these different types of tasks, you'll see different levels of state capacity. And so in the kind of typical episodic state capacity view, you'll have a set of tasks that are less transaction intensive, that are less complex, that require one-off investment. So in education, that might involve building a school. The Indian state is very good in building schools. It has done that very well. What it has not done so well is ensure that what's happening inside those schools is effective for student learning. Well, that requires much more repeated interactions with teachers, uh, along with input from households, parents, right? And working between children and, uh, and, and school teachers coming, by the way, from very different social backgrounds. 
right? So you're also having to deal with uh, societal norms of patriarchy, caste, and so on. And so that requires a different type of uh, set of state capabilities. And as I argue in the book, it requires a bureaucracy to be able to deliberate both internally and with citizens to be able to collectively solve problems, not the kind of uh, typical socialization that your district magistrate gets. And let me just end with this point. The term district magistrate already implies some legal order. The same official is in charge of law and order, is in charge of education, is in charge of many other things, and is the supervening officer. Now, just by sheer numbers, there are not enough of these people to carry out all these tasks. And I think this is brought out well in, in, in the paper by Devesh Kapoor, where he looks at the, the kind of uh, lopsidedness of the Indian state, where the share of officials in the higher level positions, right, uh, in, particularly in the federal government versus local government is much, much higher. And it's almost inverted for China or even for the United States. And so one is just the number and, 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 and both Devesh and his co-author, um, uh, uh, this is a, a paper that they've written on the kind of cognitive overload and kind of burdening of the local level bureaucrat. Uh, they find essentially that they're not able to carry out a lot of tasks just by the sheer number. Right. And so that's one key problem there at the local level, along with the norms that are really rule based legalistic, as I argue in the book. It fascinates me that the elite bureaucracy in India, the IAS, is still around 6000 people. Yes. Administrating this huge country of 1.4 billion. So it is amazing that you have these generalists, very elite who can do all tasks were supposed to be able to do all tasks. Similarly, it has amazed me in recent years to discover the Indian Foreign Service is also, in my view, understaffed. Apparently, Norway of 5.6 million people, we have more diplomats than India has. It's just mind boggling. So I think there's something lopsided. Maybe there's an Indian model of doing this. But there's another thing to this episodic state capacity that you mentioned, the Devish Kapoor argument, I actually found in my work that the bureaucracy can do amazing stuff also during visible crises. It has to be something that politicians, bureaucrats, society realizes, whether it is a flood or a cyclone, an earthquake. There are certain instances where during elections or, or visible crises, not crises, but it has to be visible because when I was studying drought, it turned out that that did not generate the response. So yes, the, the Indian bureaucracy is very efficient under certain circumstances. Coming to your focus, the role of education, for example, and, and the role of street level bureaucrats, you make this distinction between legalistic bureaucracy and deliberative bureaucracy. Help us understand how this plays out in terms of providing education, primary education at a local level. Yeah, I, I think the, the starting point before I kind of dig into those two different types that you uh, uh, just mentioned is to be uh, clear about what I mean by implementation in a sphere like education. And often when one reads about implementation, one, one, one imagines that this is the state delivering a product, right? There's a public good or a service and the state is providing it. But actually, when you think about it, something like education is often co-produced. It requires societal participation just in the very process of, of children uh, sitting in a classroom, listening to a teacher. They are co-producing their education just by sitting there. You can ex uh, extrapolate from that to a whole other slew of education policies that require societal input. And this is not unique to education, by the way. There are other policy domains where the co-production, and this is Eleanor Ostrom's really path-breaking work uh, that showed us that actually the combination of public and non-state uh, uh, resources and, 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 and intervention is needed to actually achieve a, a public outcome, a public good. And for education, both are necessary. Now, the challenge here is that in a hierarchical setting like India, co-production implies power differences because the co-producers, teachers, and the community have power differences between them and even among them. And so one has to bear that in mind when thinking about implementation in the education domain. Now, this takes us to legalistic and deliberative norms, the two distinct uh, forms of bureaucracy. I want to uh, uh, just say at the outset, these are identified as ideal types of bureaucratic cultures, sets of norms that guide how officials behave. They're not meant to just be these kind of reified binaries, but rather they could see it more as a continuum. And so when I theorize them, I think about 
what is the central tendency in a bureaucracy? In, in a legalistic bureaucracy, it is to be oriented towards rules and rules will be the basis on which I will make a decision as a bureaucrat. It will be the basis of my relations to other bureaucrats. So hierarchy matters all the more. Uh, it will be the basis for the form of communication, the written letter matters a lot more than say oral forms of communication. In a deliberative bureaucracy, and this is drawing on deliberative democratic theory, John Dewey being one of the key theorists on pragmatism and, and deliberation, it's really about a problem-based orientation, that there's a set of public problems around which I'm going to orient my role. And that will require me to think about how to solve these collectively. And it will then push me to think beyond the rules and try to modify rules in practical ways that solve needs. And as a consequence, what I theorize in the book is that in a legalistic bureaucracy, you will tend towards a much greater compliance uh, around rules. And that can achieve certain tasks like building a school, for example. Where it will flounder are those areas uh, the co-production tasks that require societal input. And the poor in particular, underprivileged citizens in particular, will experience greater burdens if they have to go through these cumbersome rules-based uh, uh, grievance processes every time there's a problem in their school. And here I draw on literature uh, by, uh, by, by Pam Hurd and, Don, and, and also Don Moynihan on administrative burdens being a problem. So when, the, when citizens try to seek services, they find looking at the United States that actually the burden of even seeking the service prohibits people from getting the public good they need. A legalistic bureaucracy, I argue in the book, is more likely to generate such burdens in the process of monitoring schools to ensure they're providing quality services. A deliberative bureaucracy, on the other hand, is much more likely to create spaces for societal input, particularly from less advantaged actors, and that allows them to be really uh, involved in co-governing a school. And you know, I give examples in the book, and I won't bore you with all the, the nuances of them, but, but one key actor I observed in my research are women's associations in rural India, who become much more involved in, 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 in the education of children. In the, in the villages that I visited, a lot of men may have moved out or they're involved in a migration-based remittance economy. Women are more central. And so their participation in education decision-making, I found to be a vital part of school governance to enable quality uh, service delivery. It turns out that a legalistic state is less capable in many ways that I observe to even see women as agents in the process of governance, let alone you know, really participants in the co-production process. So I think that distinction between the two types really helps us make sense of why it is that the same policy can have very different effects, both in terms of implementation, but also citizen responses and citizen feedback and, and, and perceptions of the state as well. Let me paint for you a picture of what I experienced when I was doing fieldwork in West Bengal and in sure. Orissa 20, 25 years ago. And uh, you helped me understand how this plays out in the four states that you studied in the book. Okay, You were studying Northern India, the Hindi belt. I was studying Eastern India. And I often found in Kalahandi, you know, the, the famine, starvation capital of India, because everybody knows it as having problems related to starvation deaths. So I would go there or in Purulia, another drought prone district in West Bengal and see that if you looked at the statistics of how many school buildings had been built in many of these so-called remote districts, the record was fantastic. Now there were two problems with this. When I visited some of these school buildings, the building was there, but there were no students. It was sometimes used as a cow shed. Even when we did have pupils there, there were kids studying, the teachers were not there because they were sitting somewhere else or on holiday and they appointed the, the school monitor or the class president to, to take over the education and do their job. So there was teacher absenteeism. In those situations, Akshay, and coming back to the four states that you study, if I'm a parent, and I am witnessing this, that there is, everybody is saying, oh, we built so many schools, but it turns out either my children are not going to go to that school because there is nothing going on in terms of teaching activity, or when they do attend school, the teacher's not there. What kind of strategies can I employ 
to rectify the situation. So what, what are my options? How can I influence this process? How can I get the street level bureaucrat to hear me out? Right. And, you know, I think this is a, a good place just to think about how it is that a formal organizational architecture that's created for accountability may or may not work, right? And so in, in, in the case of India and other countries have similar, have, have, have variations of it. Uh, the schools that I visited would have what is what was called a village education committee. They could be called a school management committee, a parent teacher committee, uh, different types of these associations. Now, a prior work has shown that actually a lot of underprivileged parents don't even know that this committee exists. Uh, they may be excluded. Right. I mean, or they're excluded. And in fact, one, one study showed that um, a lot of the, 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 the people who were members of the committee themselves didn't know that they were linked as members and they were just being kind of uh, asked for their signatures whenever decisions were made. So they were effectively excluded even as members. So first is to think about what are the, the kind of structures available to me. And uh, as I observed in a state like Uttar Pradesh, and that's, that is the archetypal legalistic bureaucracy in my book, I found that these structures were existing and they were uh, uh, supported by kind of formal processes of grievance and so on. But teachers were much better placed to defend their interests than parents were when they were competing uh, over a set of issues. So if a teacher was not coming, the teacher could very well identify a way to defend him or herself from parental complaints because they knew the administrative legal system a lot better. They knew what protections they had. And perhaps also better networks, Akshay. They may have no much, political much people. In fact, some of the bureaucrats that were supposed to monitor them could have come from the teacher cadre and got promoted up. So they would themselves know each other and have this kind of relationship. Now, in a deliberative uh, system, when the bureaucracy is encouraging societal participation, this problem-based orientation means that the bureaucracy is also seeking to rely on society to help solve some of its problems. And so what bureaucrats, I observe, would do is not just, uh, just give information that this group exists, but actually participate in meetings with the parents and encourage them to voice their complaints, even give training to parents on how it is uh, they can actually formulate an argument and a complaint that could be successful. And often they would also try to find uh, points of mutual trust between teachers and parents. So this local bureaucrat in one in, in one village, for example, found out that the school bus, the buses that were uh, that, uh, you know, from from the town center to the to the school were not functional. And that's why the teachers were coming late and they found a way to work with the bus company to change the bus timings. It was a very mundane solution that actually solved a problem. But the distance between parents and teachers was so much that they may have never reached that point of mutual trust, which is what deliberation allowed them to do. So one thing parents can do is that. Now, that might not always lead to uh, an end result one wants. And what I observe in, in another state, in, in the state of Uttarakhand, which tried to copy this model that Himachal Pradesh had of, of deliberation, what I end up finding is that the bureaucracy was not as responsive at the local level uh, to parental grievances, and so it encouraged exit. So over time, gradually, parents were deciding that voice was less to their benefit. Rather, they would exit, and they could exit in a variety of ways. And I think, sadly, that is a story for a lot of India's education system, that even in the public system today, there is de facto exit happening by students being signed up for private tuition. So this private tutoring service that the same government teacher may be providing in the evenings after school, rather than teaching uh, while in school. And you could see perverse incentives getting reinforced through the exit process. So I think when you talk about a household, the cost is quite significant, both of voice and of exit. But if one can come collectively as a community, and you know that's a big if, and I don't think that's you know something one can just say is predetermined, that, that it takes work to have collective action, which is why the results have to be tangible for parents. This is where bureaucracy can intervene by at least showing some steps along the way by reducing the administrative burdens of participation in decision-making as well. So it would require both kind of inputs from communities and from bureaucrats over an iterative process. And that's how I try to show in the book over time, it unfolds. It's not kind of a one-off intervention that you just get great co-production at the local level. I think the idea of co-production is absolutely relevant. The thing that I'm wondering about, Akshay, is can you, based on this study, identify a set of factors that help street-level bureaucrats or that incentivize 
or encourage street level bureaucrats to take part in these deliberations. So what is it that must be in place for street level bureaucrats to feel empowered or energized to consult? And one challenge I see in this field is that it isn't as if all parents or the whole of society is united behind a grievance or complaint or even agree on a particular way forward or solution. So there are numerous forces at play. Not everybody is against something. There are also some people who want to maintain the status quo, who would lose out if things change. And thereby, the street level bureaucrat is under enormous pressure. You know, it's not like one is just trying to promote the interests of underprivileged groups, but there are also very privileged groups that are doing their best to prevent any change from happening. And that itself would be a disincentive. Going back to my forest guard example from Malawi, if the street level bureaucrat feels his or her family or he or she herself is going to be hurt or compromised in any way, then maybe the incentive is less. So what would you say generally in those cases, in those states of India, where particularly in Himachal Pradesh, where was an interest to consult, there was an interest to better understand, what is it that characterized the bureaucracy there that was not the case in the other states? I think there's two two elements to answering this question. Uh, you know, one element is to look at what are the most, the more proximate uh, factors uh, that would work. And the other is to look at some of the kind of historical, you could say even deeper political underlying causes, right? So let me start with, with, with some proximate factors. One is that when you think about inculcating a, a participatory problem-centered orientation among uh, frontline officials vis-a-vis -vis society, one key step that bureaucracies can take is to encourage that precisely that within the bureaucracy itself. So it was not simply the case that frontline officials were in many cases excluding society. They themselves were being excluded from decision-making. And I'll, I'll give the example of school teachers. I mean, I think there's uh, you know probably not a single group that's vilified more than the school teacher, not just in India, all across the world. I mean, in the United States, you look at uh, education reforms that are aiming to encourage student learning. And the big problem that's raised is that teacher, that recalcitrant teacher that doesn't want to innovate and so on. Well, how many of these efforts have really taken into account the perspective, the constraints, uh, and the capabilities and ideas of that teacher? Uh, and I think that is a key question in the case of India, that a lot of the education reforms were thought about in New Delhi as if uh, the bureaucrats in Delhi knew everything about the teacher's conditions. And one practical example is that a teacher is being asked to do a whole set of things, complete a curriculum, but is actually teaching in, a, in, a, in an environment where there's that one teacher in charge of all five grades. So how can you possibly expect that? And that information teachers would tell me again and again, we're engaged in these training activities, but they're so uh, uh, out of touch with our ground realities. So one way that a, a bureaucracy can, be, can, can better align itself with local level deliberation is to encourage deliberation more internally. And, and, and one uh, incentive that can, can, that can come about through that is that the information from the local level can feed back into the policy making at the top. And Himachal Pradesh did this well, that when there was a challenge that teachers were facing, they took that information in and adapted the policy to better suit the needs of the teacher to make it more likely that they would then carry out a local level uh, kind of deliberation with parents. That is not happening quite often. So the distance, this flailing state that Land Pritchard talks about, the brain at the top and the arms that are wiggling away, part of that is by uh, is reinforced by the norms and the bureaucracy that create the massive social distance between that district magistrate, that king, that lord that you mentioned, which is very much a colonial relic. Even that that language is, is quite from that era, right? And, and, and the school teacher. The other element of the, an answer to this is historical. And the book looks at each of the states and examines the political history of state formation largely in the post 
colonial period in India. And what I argue is essentially it matters what the relationship between the bureaucrat and politician, how that evolved over time in the period of state formation. And critical for the states I look at, because India is a federal system, uh, it was largely defined by, by, the, by the political relationship between the central and the state governments, where the central government really depended on states politically. And the state of Uttar Pradesh is a prime example of that because it sent in more prime ministers than any other Indian state, India's largest state. There, the state government really didn't have to uh, do very much to get the resources it needed, right? So bureaucrats and politicians didn't have to combine their forces to work collectively. And often bureaucrats and politicians were competing with each other for access to New Delhi. And one data point I think that's interesting historically is that if you look at the, 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 the cabinet secretary of India, the highest ranking civil servant, I think 15 out of the uh, out of the 31 cabinet secretaries of India have come from Uttar Pradesh. And so that gives you an example of the power of that state. But it meant that these two uh, key actors, the politician and the bureaucrat, didn't have to combine their energies right, to develop a, a kind of set of norms around local level participation. Himachal Pradesh was excluded. I mean, it was marginalized. It wasn't made a state until 1971. Uh, it, it actually had to fight for resources. It was actually the, the first state that was financially unviable on its own. So it needed central transfers. To get those transfers, those fiscal transfers from New Delhi, bureaucrats and politicians had to combine, had to engage in collective action. Every couple of years, they had to work together. And that had a, a knock-on effect on, on middle-level and lower-level bureaucrats. I was able to interview some of these officials from the time of state formation who could tell me these uh, experiences they had with the chief minister and other senior politicians and how that uh, inculcated in them this need to also deliberate with their subordinates to solve problems collectively. So that is a political his history, a political economy, a variable that's underlying all this that I think we need to look at more closely. And it brings together this kind of notion of state capacity over time and more kind of proximate indicators of bureaucratic effectiveness. And I think these two domains have really been speaking uh, insularly and kind of can talk to each other a bit more uh, to understand an answer or to develop an answer to your question uh, across, you know, not just India, but other countries as well. A couple of things to end this conversation, Akshay. One has to do with something which may appear relatively simple, but is quite difficult. And that has to do with the bureaucracy and the idea of hierarchy. There's something inherently contradictory. So in the literature, of course, there's quite a lot of emphasis on roles and hierarchies that ensure discipline. And yet you are trying to make a very persuasive case for teamwork, listening to juniors, and this does not often happen. And I've found this to be true in terms of implementation of pollution control in Tamil Nadu in India, that it is not that there wasn't any rule or legislation. It is just the inability to, to listen to feedback that is being provided. This dismissiveness that we know best, as you said, in the state capitals or in the national capitals. So it, it's something relatively simple, at least for us, to think that we should listen to our juniors, but that turns out to be more difficult in practice. So I wish to ask you the final question, which is really the kind of policy implications to address this huge learning crisis that many low-income countries face. How should we address this challenge, Akshay, based on this study, this impressive study you've done in India, what would you suggest to policymakers, to aid agencies, to international organizations? What is it that one should be focusing on to address this huge learning crisis in many, many parts of the world? Two thoughts that I would put forward. The first is to recognize that, just as you said, these are agencies that are hierarchical. They have long histories of not listening, uh, both internally and to society. And so to think that in one fell swoop, uh, an intervention will change this hierarchical system, I think is a mistake. And so the first point I would make is that any intervention would have to begin incrementally. 
and try to identify who are the entrepreneurs within that system? Who are the bureaucrats who are what I would also call positive deviants? They're trying to in instantiate what you're saying, uh, this kind of listening, but are not able to. And are there ways one can support them? And one way to do that is to encourage their experimentation in a defined way perhaps starting at a local level in India, a district is a good unit. It's pretty large, about 2 million people or so. And it's enough to establish the proof of a, of, of a policy concept. Can one work at that level and establish that something or how something can work and then get some more support for it in a gradual and incremental sort of way, recognizing that there isn't going to be a big bang solution for, for an entire place. And one, one uh, example of that is to kind of, uh, uh, you know, take from, you know, take the lessons that we have from community level governance. There have been ma major reforms in India to make the panchayat, the village level government have a lot greater say and more capability. And there have been experiments that have worked better than others uh, in parts of India. We can learn from those and try to aggregate some broad lessons of those and, and, and use them as examples. Another thing that I would point out that I think is, is crucial, particularly for a domain like education, is that so much of what education policy is happens outside of the education bureaucracy. It requires societal input, but other agencies, health agencies, nutrition, uh, and pre-primary care. And so interagency coordination, kind of breaking down the, the communication barriers between agencies. And you know, there's one possibility there where you mentioned this transfer raj, that bureaucrats are transferred around places. Places. That is certainly a limiting factor in many ways, but it also is a mechanism that already enables a bureaucrat to learn and, uh, you know, across different sectors. Is there a way to institutionalize that in, in a way that encourages communication across different, uh, you know, different sectors of a bureaucracy? And so in India's national education policy 2020, there's a real attempt to encourage the kind of pre-primary education alongside primary, but these bureaucracies are just not talking to each other. And I think breaking, uh, breaking down that communication barrier, giving them some incentives to work together initially at a local level, but then extrapolating from that. And I think the big challenge there will be scaling it up. Uh, and I don't have an easy answer for how you scale up these sorts of changes, uh, but I do think it will require for one, making the bureaucracy more inclusive of disadvantaged groups. I mean, that is something that we're seeing can have some effect in, in policing, having more women in the police and some of my follow on research, but it's not just about hiring more uh, uh, of a minority. It's also supporting and enabling and empowering them, which is uh, not something that's easily done in a hierarchical system. So yeah, I, I leave you with that. It's, it's more puzzles in the end than answers per se, but I think experimentation incrementally is the way to go. I really enjoyed our chat today, Akshay. Congratulations on a wonderful book. And thank you very much for coming on my show today. Thank you. And I really enjoyed the conversation, Dan. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo. Please email your questions, comments and suggestions to Development at gmail.com.